1849, when the first we first had the state auditor, Suzanne is the 22nd state auditor. There have been nine Democrats, Suzanne is the ninth, ten Republicans, and two Whigs who have served <laughs> as state auditors. Um, to the best of my research, however, Suzanne is, distinguishes herself as the first woman to occupy the position. <laughs> I really think it is important for us to understand the context of the state auditor's election and her role now. Uh, Suzanne was in, I think, a very active, friendly battle to win uh, her position among Democrats. And what's nice about Democrats is when the election is over, people still work together. They don't. They're not negative. They want to help the Commonwealth out. And I, I think that is a great attribute to the individuals as well as to our party. But in her, or shortly after her election, um, I think the, the accountability factor, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent, the accountability for state government is very high. Uh, maybe the highest it's ever been, partly because of Deval Patrick and Tim Murray, partly because of Steve Grossman, partly because of our, our um, okay. State Attorney General, thank you, Martha Coakley, and partly because of Suzanne, and partly because of the media. People in bad economic times want to make sure that their state tax dollars are spent wisely and for what they were intended to do. And a great deal of that responsibility falls on Suzanne Bump's shoulders. Um, and it's not an easy task when you think of how many state agencies there are and how many agencies receive funds, and I tried to figure this out today and was un unable to, how many it, organizations receive funds from the state that are subject to the state auditor auditing their books. So the job is not an easy job. Um, and the, the, I think from my own perspective, the pressure um, for accountability like the uh, recent Somerville Housing Authority um, doesn't make it easy. But um, my sense is from watching what Suzanne has been doing and reading about the work she has been doing is that the accountability factor is very clear in her mind and in the mind of her staff. And with that said, I'm happy to introduce Suzanne. Thank you. thank you, Paul, for that introduction. And thank you also for the invitation to, uh, to be here. Um, I'm really excited uh, to talk about the Office of State Auditor. Um, so let me start uh, with a couple of, uh, of points here. First of all, I love this job. It is, um, it is fabulous uh, opportunity for me, particularly as someone um, who is a Democrat, who is in fact dedicated to making sure that I do everything I can to build public confidence in government. Um, Barney Frank is being quoted a lot lately uh, for obvious reasons. One of the things that he said that has really stuck with me is not one of the wittiest of his uh, comments. It's not one of the most biting of his comments either. The one that resonates with me is that he said, government is the name we give to the things we choose to do together. That means, that says a lot to me about the purposes of government, the fact that it is supposed to serve the collected, collective good, but also it speaks to the fact that government only exists with the consent of the governed. Every policy that gets enacted, every law that gets passed, every tax 
dollar that gets collected, it only happens if the public is behind it, if the, if the governed are consenting to it. And so that means to me, that speaks to me about the role that I have as an elected official in keeping government accountable to the people. Um, this is the way that I approached government when I was a state representative uh, in the town of Braintree many years ago. Uh, from 1985 till 1993, I was the state representative there. It's the way that I approached government when I was back in public service for the first time as Deval Patrick's cabinet um, secretary. What I liked most about both of those prior uh, opportunities for me in government um, was pacing through and figuring out how it was that we could get to problems that were confronting people by fixing things in state government, by bringing data to bear to help us do more strategic planning, to measure performance, to manage um, government resources, to have the desired outcome. Um, and I know that sounds a lot um, of, like a lot of uh, abstract thought. Um, it sounds uh, hard to understand why someone uh, would get so excited about this as I do. Um, but it's because there's an enormous human element behind the work that we do. And let me give you an example of that. We have a, a standing Medicaid unit within the uh, auditor's office. It spends its time sifting through literally millions of transactions in the Medicaid or Mass Health program. And we look for possible provider fraud. So doctors or other providers whose billing seem out of whack for the number of clients that they're seeing and the and the medical health profiles of the people um, that they are seeing. And we find, um, doing this, that there is uh, fraud, um, that there is sometimes overbilling, duplicate billing, billing, billing for services that never were rendered. But you know what else we find? And, and we, we find that and we refer it back to the agency and sometimes we refer it to prosecutors in the attorney general's office or in, in the district courts for prosecution. But we also find something that's even more horrifying than that. We find providers, and we have found this in dental audits this year, that are actually over-treating kids we're subjecting them to multiple unnecessary x-rays, multiple fluoride treatments in excess of s recommended standards from the, uh, from the pediatric um, association just so they can drive up their billings. And so that's a public health component to the work that we do. Another quick example is a criminal justice component to the work that we do. Uh, a number of audits were coming across my desk earlier this year. Um, earlier uh, last year, actually, about a year ago this time, uh, they were of district courts. We are always auditing the, the court system. District court audits were coming in, and a number of them had, had one of the same findings. You know, we're, what we're doing is, of course, we're following the money and asking how the agency spent it. So we're finding, though, in this case, that they weren't collecting all the revenue that they were supposed to. They collect fines and fees, and they weren't collecting, in some of these district courts, they weren't collecting all of the fees that they should have. Um, they weren't collecting an increase in a fee that the legislature had passed. And it wasn't because they didn't know about the fee. They didn't, it wasn't because they didn't know how they should collect it. They'd had ample instructions as to how they were going to do it. It's that some judges didn't think it was fair. They decided on their own that they weren't going to follow the law. And so we saw these few said to ourselves, hmm, wonder how many more there are. And so instead of doing what we normally do in the auditor's <coughs> office, and that is continuing on a path of auditing individual courts and going from top to bottom, looking at every item, I said, no, I want to know right now how many are not doing this and get this fixed. And so we did a survey of them. We found that, uh, that a good 25 
percent of them were not collecting all of the fees that they were supposed to. And so we quickly brought that to the attention of the district court administrator. It's a matter of money, yes, but it's also a matter of the fair administration of the justice system because the amount that you have to pay as, in a, as a fee shouldn't depend upon the, you know, the, the whim of the sitting justice in that court. If, if the legislature says the fee is X, then it should be X everywhere across the state, um, not just uh, where the judges decide they're going to collect it. So, so those are a couple of examples of the kind of usual work, though, of the auditor's office. As I said, we follow the money. We ask the questions about how the money is being spent. We ask three basic questions historically in the auditor's office. The questions are, you know, how much did you spend? What did you spend it on? And, and what did we, as the Commonwealth, get for it? Um, but we've started to ask another question in the auditor's office. We want to know how we can do it better the next time. So let me give you one example of, uh, of how asking that question can make a difference. Uh, you might have read that in, uh, in August, early September, um, we, re we released a series of audits on education collaboratives. Education collaboratives are formed when school districts come together in order to jointly purchase uh, special ed services for their special needs <coughs> kids. Uh, and it's more cost effective for the communities and it provides a better um, environment for the, for the kids as well because there are more um, youngsters with whom they can interact and uh, you know, with similar situations and the like. And so it's supposed to save money and be beneficial to the, uh, to the students as well. Um, there had been audits done of education collaboratives in the past and they had found areas of, of misspending, of uh, failure to account for all the money. Some, some of them were keeping surpluses. They were collecting assessments from the school districts but, and, they, and they were keeping more money than they needed to. They should have been returning money to the school districts, obviously of concern to the local property taxpayers. <coughs> Um, and I saw that there were going to be some more audits coming out of the, uh, the office uh, later last year. So what, we, what I said we're going to do differently this time is that instead of, I, just in, kind of in the case of the court system, you know, instead of just putting out these audits and having them go to the boards of directors of the collaboratives and have them go to the education department and sit on some shelf, we're going to keep them back, we're going to hold them back, we're going to look at them all and we're going to see what are the common findings in these audits and in the ones from the, from the past and what does this, the, these findings have to say about the adequacy of the system of governing education collaboratives. So that was our plan. You might have read um, that shortly before we released our audits, the Inspector General um, hit, the, hit the press with wrongdoing that he found up at Merrimack um, up in Merrimack Valley at the Merrick, Merrimack Special Ed Collaborative. That's one of the collaboratives that we had been auditing ourselves. And so he put out, he put out the, the general alarm about wrongdoing up there, particularly around pension abuse, particularly around um, siphoning off money and sending it to a, uh, another related nonprofit that they had, uh, had set up. Um, with a failure to explain why the money was going over there. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we put out our, our audits um, of three collaboratives, but we did something else. As I suggested at the beginning, we also took a look at what all of the audits that had now been done of six educational collaboratives said about the system of governance. Um, and what we found was that there was inadequate um, fiscal accountability to the local school committees. There was inadequate structure for the Department of Ed to set standards for the, uh, for the collaboratives and so they weren't complying with all the rules that school districts had to. Their teachers uh, or the instructors in the classroom weren't all certified and there was little that the Department of Ed was able to do about it. And so we made uh, a set of recommendations to the legislature just Friday, the, uh, the governor signed 
um, our recommendations into law. The legislature immediately responded so that we added new governance structures and new accountability mechanisms into this system so that no longer can administrators and board members uh, use those collaboratives to serve themselves. They're going to serve the special needs students and the taxpayers that they were supposed to serve. So that's a new way that we're using the auditor's office by asking that question of how can we do it better. Um, I think that Paul uh, alluded at the, in the beginning to, uh, to my own levels of accountability in that office. I mean, you can see that I want to hold government agencies to high standards. Um, if I want to do that, if I want to have credibility in doing that, then I've got to hold the auditor's office to high standards. And so the first thing that I did upon being elected, even before I was sworn in, was that I worked with my predecessor, Joe DiNutri, to request the first peer review that had been done of the auditor's office in 15 years. Peer reviews normally are done every three years in, um, under the auspices of the National State Auditors Association, but in Massachusetts we hadn't had one for a number of years. So auditors came in from around the country. They spent time in advance poring over uh, our files. Um, they came in and they looked in greater detail at audit, uh, uh, at audit work from the past couple of years. Um, and they wrote a report and they found that there were deficiencies in the auditor's office. Um, in, in the way that we were planning our audits, the way that we were documenting them, the way we are reporting them, and they questioned really the capacity of some of the staff to do the job. So we made, I, I released a new um, a vision for the office, we brought in um, new professional expertise, we completely revamped all of our policies and procedures, and we also um, created a, a budget because there had been none for um, professional development within the office, professional development, so that the staff gets trained to do the work uh, that needs to be done and also to help us think about how we can use these audits in a different way to make government uh, work better. Um, it's, it's meant a lot of adjustment, as you can imagine, for the staff um, that's there. Uh, and it, you know, I had to overcome a little bit of skepticism and and questioning about where it was that I was going to go with this and was I really going to be fair or was this just another excuse for uh, bringing in my own people. But we set higher standards. We did recruiting at business colleges um, and we have professional um, staff now filling many of the roles where there had been folks that simply hadn't had the education uh, and training to do the job. And we are, we have new quality assurance systems as well to make sure that our audits are meeting those higher levels. Um, at, we, have, we have a short period of time more to get this right because those auditors are going to be coming back um, in two more years. Um, they're going to be peer reviewing uh, the work that's been done under me and I am determined that we're not going to get the kind of adverse findings uh, that, we, that we had before because, as I said, I want to build confidence in state government, and I feel that I have to model the behavior that I expect from other state agencies. I'll make one other point um, that Paul raised, and then I'll be happy to, uh, uh, to answer questions. Um, Paul wondered how many vendors or contractors there were that deliver state services. You know what? I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you it's a couple of thousand. What I can tell you, though, I, uh, during the campaign when I was talking about this and the need to open up the auditor's office to, um, to new, not only new ways of thinking, but new emphases on areas where taxpayer dollars are at greater risk, greatest risk. I talked about the fact that we need to spend more time looking at vendors and contractors of the Commonwealth. At that time, I thought that the amount of money that was being spent by the state on services being delivered to the citizens through private companies was about 50%. According to a conference that I just attended a couple of weeks ago sponsored by the governor's office, it's closer to 70%. So 70% of the dollars that are being spent on government services are not being provided by state employees. They're being provided by private companies. Some of them are for profit, 
particularly in, for instance, construction. Um, a lot of them are nonprofit, particularly in human services. Um, we, in my office, need to be spending more and more time monitoring the compliance of those private companies with the standards that government sets. So if you are going to be spending public money, then you've got to be adhering to a set of rules that makes sure that the public is being benefited and not the corporate, um, the corporate folks, uh, and that services are, are being provided. So we are, are, are um, you know, moving some resources in the auditor's office so that we can focus uh, even more in that area. 70% being provided, not directly through state agencies, but through private contractors. So you've heard what, you know, what motivates me to, uh, to do this. You've heard that I love the job. You've heard about the kind of innovation that I want to I wanna bring to it. But now I want to hear from you. Um, I want to hear what your questions are about the auditor's office, because believe me, I've only scratched the surface. I was having, uh, chatting at, uh, uh, at dinner just a few moments ago, um, and we talked a good half hour about the work of the office, and we didn't even talk about any of the stuff that I just shared with you. We were talking about a whole nother area of operation. Um, so I hope that in your questions you might be able to, uh, to drag some more of that out of me, but also I want to hear what your ideas are for how we can make government work better. Yes, sir. Um, I, I have a question for you from the, the perspective of, of local government, and uh, I served for 10 years on a school committee and I'm now on, on a town council in Franklin. And, and oftentimes we get uh, legislation that, that's passed, and I saw it more on the school side, uh, a, a set of protocols and a set of uh, regulations and, and actions that that town has to adopt and incorporate. And I was under the understanding that the auditor's office would provide a, a cost analysis of the uh, monetary impact to the community uh, for what that legislation uh, would would involve financially for that community. Is that a service that the auditor's office offers? And if so, how uh, does a local community get, uh, who do they get in touch with, how do they get in touch with them, and how do they get that type of information okay. from the office? So the question, as you, as you heard, concerns state mandates. And what role does the auditor's office play with regard to state mandates? Well, in fact, there is an office uh, comprised of four people in the, uh, in the auditor's office uh, that is known as the Division of Local Mandates. Um, there is, although we throw the term local mandate around a lot, um, when for our purposes, for our purposes of analyzing under the law in the auditor's office. We're talking about um, requirements that have been imposed by the state on municipalities since the advent of Proposition 2 and a half. So first of all, the mandate has to have been imposed by the state since 1981 in order for it to fall into this category of unfunded mandates, um, which then the state if there's a determination by my office um, uh, that it is an unfunded mandate, then the state has to find some way of relieving the community of that, either through uh, relieving the, the, the burden of compliance or by funding it. Um, the state auditor's office uh, responds, uh, works in two ways with regard to mandates. One is that we do respond to requests from municipalities for determinations. Um, and secondly, we do um, municipal impact studies uh, to help com uh, communities collectively uh, deal with, uh, with an increased uh, cost. I'll give you a couple, two examples of something that we've done. Most recently, um, we were asked by uh, two communities, Waltham and Danvers, to, uh, to determine whether the cost of, of helping homeless kids who have been placed with their families in temporary housing in a new community, helping them go back to school in their original community, um, and, and with resultant costs to both communities now, constituted an unfunded mandate. Um, we concluded that it did. 
because this was something that communities had never been asked to do before, and that is help educate someone who no longer lives within the borders of that town. Com communities, uh, you know, right from the beginning of this, of this country, this commonwealth, have been required to educate kids in their own, within the own, their own four corners. Um, now school districts were being asked, um, because the state voluntarily entered into a federal program uh, some almost 10 years ago um, that required municipalities to, uh, to bus kids back to their home school, if that's what the parents wanted to do, no matter how far away the, the temporary housing uh, was, um, that, that's an unfunded mandate. So we made that determination at the beginning of December, um, and we laid that at the doorstep of the legislature. But I knew, having been a legislator myself, that that really did not decide the matter, um, because what was the legislature supposed to do? There was no data that would allow them to calculate how much money they were going to provide, have to provide to schools across the Commonwealth who were incurring costs. So we did a survey um, of all of the municipalities um, and determined that over $11 million is being spent this year um, by these communities. And you know, it's, it's not like your local school transportation. You can negotiate that. You can change bus routes. You can make kids walk farther. These were totally unpredictable expenses that were totally beyond the costs of, um, beyond, beyond the uh, um, ability to plan by local communities. And so, and for some communities, the amounts were staggering. Boston, three quarters of a million dollars. Three communities out in Western Mass uh, were running at a half a million dollars, over $250,000. Um, in fact, for 33 communities in the Commonwealth, it's over $100,000. Um, so now we are working with the legislature, now that we have concrete numbers, to address this issue. Another example comes uh, from uh, a report, in this case it was a report, not a mandate determination, about local dam safety. Uh, the state increased the requirements um, for owners of dams to, uh, to have more rigorous inspections and to maintain them to higher safety standards, um, and it I, it affected some 100, I think, municipal dams. Many dams are old, old dams are owned by municipalities, um, and it at considerable considerable cost um, for those municipalities to meet the new standards. Um, this report came out. I can't remember, frankly, if it came out right under. Greatest, I was taking office just before I took office or just after I took office. But at any rate, what we did with that report was we took it to the legislature and got them to pass legislation that allows municipalities to get into a grant and low cost loan pool so that they can make necessary repairs uh, to, the, uh, to the dams and try to ease the burden on local taxpayers. So, I'm sure you never expected such a long answer <laughs> to, uh, to a simple question. <laughs> but, it, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it gives you, it gives you, an, a, you know, two different examples of how our division of local mandates can make a contribution to local taxpayers' concerns. Sir? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I usurping your role here? Town of Franklin again. This Wednesday, our outside auditors are presenting their findings eight months after the close of the fiscal year, which I understand is not unusual for, for, for towns. Right. How long, when you do a fiscal audit, I mean, when you do a fiscal audit, how long is it after the close of the fiscal year? Well, that's a good question, and the answer is we don't do financial audits of that type. There are three types of well, government. State agency, you want to do a fiscal not audit? not financial audits. No, we don't do them. Who does um, it? it is done under a program called the. Uh, uh, we have the comprehensive annual financial report of the Commonwealth, and then we have the single um, audit of the Commonwealth, and that's done just of programs that have federal spending components in them. The um, the auditor's office. There are three kinds of government auditing, financial, uh, compliance, 
and performance. Uh, back when, as Paul was reading the history of this office, back when the auditor's office was created, it was the auditor of accounts, and in fact it was just about the numbers. It was just about making sure that the balance sheets are there, all income, all revenues, you know, everything um, was in order. At some point, and frankly I don't know when it was, in the 20th century, um, we started moving away from fiscal auditing and uh, financial auditing and into compliance auditing. And that's <coughs> most of what my office does now. So compliance auditing is when you go into an agency or go to a contractor and say, okay, these are the rules that you're supposed to be complying with when you're spending the money to guard it against uh, uh, someone you know, embezzling it, sticking the money in their pocket, uh, to make sure that contracts are being fairly let, uh, to make sure that, uh, that um, you're getting a fair, a fair price. So we have all of these internal uh, controls that we look at. You know, so whatever the procedures are that an agency is supposed to be following, we can go in and audit those, and that's mostly what we do. What I want to get us doing more of is this kind of performance auditing. That is that, that how well are we doing this? How can we do it better? What better result can we get for the taxpayer? How is it that we should reshape the agencies that are responsible to deliver, for delivering these services so that they better coordinate with the locals or with other state agencies? So how do we get the most value for our dollar? That's what I really think the role of the auditor's office in the 21st century can be because now we have so many more means of collecting data and analyzing that data and figuring out um, the best way to do things. Um, so that's the answer to the question. And, and you know what, we also don't do auditing of local age of uh, municipalities <laughs> unless we're asked in by the city council and the mayor. Um, otherwise, the, the locals are are on their own. Yes. Um, I was. Um, I think it'd be nice if, like, the um, dep your department could also, or let's say, um, be more positive too. I mean, we always hear all the negatives. Okay. Oh, we found that this much money was fraud. This much was wasted, and it all just feeds into um, the whole attitude that tons of money's wasted. We should have no taxes because it's all wasted anyway. Right. It'd be nice if with every news release and everything you find, if there could also be, well, we also looked at these, you know, 10 agencies and they all did, you know, they all performed well, so right. just this many people, blah, 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 just to get right. a whole positive component to every news release would be good. Well, this may come as a surprise to you, but we actually do put out, um, uh, press releases that accompany our audits of no findings. The media is not so much interested. <laughs> and when you do, and when you're saying that somebody spent their dollars well, as, as when you say they didn't spend them well. But you know, when, hand in hand, though, yeah. when you found the bad one, meanwhile, there's, you know, many right. the other good ones. Right. No, we, um, we, no, we do do that. And actually, um, in most instances, um, are you, in most instances, it's a mixed bag. Um, there might be something that they're doing wrong, but they're doing other things right. Uh, in the case of some of those education collaboratives, though, it was hard to find the good, um, particularly that one up, on the, uh, up in Merrimack uh, Valley. There's very little good going on uh, uh, there from a financial point of view. Programmatically, we don't, we don't, we don't look at, at programmatically, but anecdotally, we heard that they were actually delivering the services. But at any rate, we, um, we, we do try to do that. And the way, um, it, it's, it's unfortunate um, that the public doesn't, doesn't get to hear that message as often as some of the, the groups that we deal with. So we, um, we work a lot, actually, with housing authorities, uh, for instance, and with human services um, providers. And we want them to know who's doing a good job so that then we can help them identify best practices that others of them can emulate. Um, and so we, and actually I just have started a new effort in the office to do more of that kind of outreach to more of those kinds of organizations so that we can spread more of, uh, you know, of best practices 
um, not just in state agencies, but to vendors of the Commonwealth. Because I don't, I, I, I don't want to have to be telling everybody all the time you did it wrong. Um, you know, I want to be able to well, celebrate. I think that's very yeah. valuable. It's just right. that there's this whole other piece. You know, this whole perception that everything's waste. And right. Every time there's a big headline of you doing a great job. I know. I know. It. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah we we end up doing a lot of cataloging of wrong, um, in an effort to get it right. But yeah, folks, in the short term, dwell on the wrong. Yes. So help help me understand your resolve of what seems to be to me an inconsistency in what you said, or at okay. least the confusion I'm having. On the one hand, you said you don't do financial audits, right? Which actually disappoints me. Some uh, but and that you are interested in, in performance audits. Mm -hmm. And then when you're talking about the school educational collaborative, you're talking about um, mishandling of funds, which sounds like something that would come out in the financial audit, audit. And you're also talking about you don't know about the program, which is something that would have come out in a performance audit. So, uh, you know, I, I don't understand how the statements fit together. It, it's all a matter of what you're... Um, your major focus is. In a financial audit, um, you are interested in tracking down and accounting for, um, for every penny. In a compliance audit, you are looking to see that you have the systems in place to track down and account for every penny. We don't do that, that, that calculation to see that you have accounted for every penny, but that you have the capacity to do it, and that we can have confidence that you're doing it properly. Um, that's a distinction between between the financial audits and the um, and the compliance audits. I mean, we we aren't indifferent to it, and in some instances, in some parts of an audit, we will indeed check that your numbers matched up. What we find, you know, because we do system testing, so we you say this is your system, we go in and check to see you have that system, and then we test that system to make sure that we can't get something by it that shouldn't have occurred. But we don't do the accounting for every dollar and cent that gets, um, that gets uh, uh, reported by you. With regard to, to programmatic audits, um, and, and why didn't we look at how well that program was actually delivering services to special ed kids because that wasn't the purpose of this audit. We could do, we, you know, we, we can do in agencies, um, once we enhance our capacity to do it, that kind of work. You know, I had not appreciated, um, people ask, what's your greatest frustra frustration with the job? Um, I'll tell you, it, 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 it's, um, it's that there is a bigger gulf than I appreciated between the training that auditors have to, uh, to do the work that they do and that I have had as a lawyer and also in government um, to look at agencies and try to figure out what's going wrong in terms of their outcomes. Um, they, the two, they're very distinct disciplines, which I hadn't appreciated um, until I got there. I mean, I knew they were different. I talked about that during the campaign, but the gulf between them I hadn't fully appreciated. And so that's why another reason why the professional development program that we have in the auditor's office is so important, because at the same time, we have to help people drill down and you know, look even more closely at detail, we also have to train them to look up at the big picture. Those are two distinctly different ways of doing business. And so, um, you know, an another audit that we did was, uh, did I, I, I think I mentioned CPCS. Uh, the, or was I talking at the table? Okay, so this was the um, legal counsel to indigent services, uh, to indigent people. So when you are, um, are, are uh, charged with a crime, and in some cases in civil inst there's civil instances, when the state makes available legal counsel to you, if you are uh, income eligible, 
Um, that, that's right. We were talking about this at the, uh, at the table. So the district attorneys were complaining to the public and to the legislature in 2010 when I was running for office that their budgets were being cut, but the amount of money that we were spent on legal services to the indigent was going up, um, even as the number of cases, you know, criminal cases were going down, crime was going down. So what's going on here? So we, I said, you know, that's a, that's a question that's worthy of attention by the auditor's office, and I'm going to look at that when I get in there. And so we did. And so we looked at how that agency, um, the uh, Committee for Public Counsel Services, was administering this program. And we, um, and we looked, um, my auditors you know, looked at it. They looked at their internal controls, because a number of years ago when they had last looked at the office, they found that they didn't have systems to make sure that the lawyers, the private lawyers who were billing, were only billing for services they actually provided, um, you know, weren't double billing and, and the like. And we said, gee, those internal controls are, are doing, uh, are, are, are good. Um, and they tested them. They couldn't get any, you know, anything through there that shouldn't have been, um, been through there. Um, and so, frankly, they didn't know where to go after that. Um, they said, oh. So we said, well, how about looking at, at this, not just as that, at that one agency, but let's look at the system. And so they broadened the view to include the role that another agency plays in this process. Um, that other agency is the poor, beleaguered probation department because the probation department staff you know, has probation officers in every court and they are the ones who have the responsibility in the courts of taking the information from people who are looking for legal services and determining whether they are income eligible for it. When we looked at it, just in the district courts, we did a sample of the district courts, we found a rate of 98% non-compliance by probation department staff with the requirement that you'd make an income um, eligibility determination. Only 2% of the cases were being verified. So as soon as we went in there, the new, the acting probation commissioner immediately sprang to, you know, to, to work. Um, developed the policies and procedures, uh, trained the staff, and they are now, so been, he's been doing that for the past six months. I can't even remember how long it's been. Pro actually, I think less than that, just maybe four months. Um, and they are testing in courts um, and finding that uh, the systems are working. Um, when they do manual checks, uh, they're finding very, you know, very low rates of, uh, of people trying to you know, get around the systems and claim, claim benefits uh, when they weren't entitled to them. But at any rate, um, it's an example of how they, the auditors did their job, they looked at that agency, and they didn't know what else to do. They didn't, they didn't know how to, they weren't trained to look at the bigger picture. Um, and you know, it, even the example that I did give you about educational collaboratives, they had always just put these reports out serially. They went to the board of the education collaborative and the board would see you know, what went wrong and how they needed to fix it. But you know, until this year, no one ever said, let's take a look at what all of this, what all these trees mean in terms of the forest. What's the picture of the forest? And that's when we found that we really had major governance and accountability problems in the whole system and that, you know, that the towns needed more help in, run, in governing these things and so did the state. So it's, it's the very different ways of, uh, of thinking. So we're having to, you know, it means that in addition to audit, uh, hiring auditors, now we're looking for people that have some other disciplines, maybe in some public policy um, or public administration, or even in some cases, depending on where we're going to go, you know, some e economic backgrounds, you know, a lot of different disciplines need to get integrated into it. As you can tell, I find this fascinating. <laughs> I, one of the things that I, I if, and I'm, I'm certainly, I don't work in your office, one of the things I do know to the question that state agencies do are audited in terms of their finances. 
So I, I, it just doesn't happen to come under Suzanne's office. Okay. Uh, outside auditors do perform financial audits. I, I didn't want that. I, I think that it's K KPMG has a role in both the, um, the, the CAFR, the Comprehensive Audit of uh, Financial Reports, and um, and the uh, and also in that single audit of the of the Commonwealth, uh, we have contracts with them. Oh, the, uh, the comptroller has contracts with them. We, as in the state, not we, as in my office. I'm I'm going to take the opportunity <coughs> to ask the last question. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the Inspector General, mm -hmm. and that is not a constitutional officer. And if you could explain the difference between the Inspector General's <coughs> responsibilities and your responsibilities, I think that would be very helpful. Okay, great. Um, so thank you. Um, the Inspector General is not a constitutional officer, but is appointed jointly by three of us, by the Governor, the Attorney General, and myself. Um, the Inspector General is appointed to a six-year term, um, and the Inspector General position was born out of a um, uh, scandal back in the late 70s into the early 80s uh, around public construction. In this instance, it was the, the construction of the UMass Boston campus and um, irregularities in the way the contract was given and the construction there and, uh, and all of that. There was a lot of corruption that was found. And so the Office of the Inspector General was created in response to that. Um, to oversee uh, potential fraud in government, and that's government including uh, local government. And so the, the major focus of the office is actually in so-called procurement fraud. Um, but they do other kinds of fraud as well. It might be in the issuance of licenses. It could actually involve um, state agencies as well as municipalities. Of, uh, they've recently done some of their own work in, um, in Medicaid auditing. They have done some, um, some uh, actually it's not strictly speaking auditing. I use that term loosely because the, actually, the Inspector General's office doesn't audit to government standards. Um, the way that we have to in order to get um, you know, positive peer review. We audit to standards that are, are prescribed by the uh, Government Accountability uh, Office. Uh, and so we, our work sometimes intersects with the Inspector General's office, uh, but they have a, their focus really, as I said, is more on fraud than ours is on waste and abuse and practices. But there is sometimes, there's sometimes a little bit of overlap. Suzanne, thank you very much for being here. Anthony, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. As you could see, I can talk about this all night. Thank you very much. Thanks.